It was the moment of impact that led to monumental heartache. People were crying. People wouldn't, you know, couldn't believe. From everyday Americans who grieved. And the enormity of that is hard to accept. To those who lost loved ones that day. I just wanted to wake up. Just, just somehow, just have it not happen. The collective shock reverberated throughout our region. Miles away, but mired in sorrow. It just doesn't seem fair. As a nation came together 20 years ago, tonight we honor the memories and reflect on what happened that fateful day. And thank you for joining us for the CBS and Sacramento special September 11th, 20 years later. I'm Tony Lopez. And I'm Elizabeth Kling. That day changed the nation and the world we live in. When the attacks happened, the shock waves touched every part of the country. Today, Elizabeth, Curtis, Marley, and I will be taking a look at how 9-11 impacted and changed Northern California. So much to digest. Thank you for joining us. Let's begin where it all started when the first plane struck the North Tower of the World Trade Center. It was 546 in the morning here in California. Many people woke up to the news and the unrelenting stream of images that followed. Many Californians started their day with this image, smoke billowing from the northern tower of the World Trade Center. Minutes later, at 6.03 Pacific time, a second plane hits the south tower. A third plane crashed into the Pentagon just over a half hour later at 6.37. Minutes later, for the first time in history, the FAA grounded all flights in the U.S. Flights were turned around mid-air, including some that returned to Sacramento. The captain informing passengers why. He was told that we were under attack. You know, the United States was under attack. People were crying. And the White House and U.S. Capitol were evacuated. At 6.59 Pacific time, the South Tower of the World Trade Center came crashing down. Just as the horror of that began to register, eight minutes later, Flight 93 went down in a Pennsylvania field after passengers and crew tried to retake the plane. Oh my God, there it goes. 102 minutes after being hit by the first plane, the World Trade Center's North Tower collapses. The attacks were carried out by 19 militants associated with Al-Qaeda. They remain the deadliest terrorist attack on American soil. Nearly 3,000 were killed in the attacks. Most were in the World Trade Center and surrounding areas. In the 20 years since, just 60% of those who died that day in New York have officially been identified. Just this week, New York's chief medical examiner's office identified two more victims and vowed to continue their work. According to the CDC, at least 29 people from California died in the attacks. All four hijacked flights were originally destined for either Los Angeles or San Francisco. And at least one Californian died in the World Trade Center, a young woman from San Francisco. Here's part of our report from that day. Chaos outside the World Trade Center. Inside, frightened victims who stare death in the face, like Lauren Grancolas, a Bay Area writer who was on the 101st floor. She called her husband and left this agonizing message to say goodbye. I just wanted to wake up and just, just somehow just have it not happen, have it be a bad dream. Those emotional voice messages still so haunting 20 years later now. But amid all of the deaths, there were also survivors. Hundreds of people made it out of the Twin Towers. Including a man from Lodi. We spoke with Corey Daniels' wife, Kim, the day after the attack about what she was thinking as she watched the horror knowing her husband was inside one of those buildings. You know, just watching that picture, you don't think that somebody's going to survive that. I, I was thinking he was probably dead. That was my initial thought. As Kim prepared for the worst news. The phone rang and it was Corey, so I knew that he was okay. 20 years later, Corey Daniels still lives in Lodi. Mm -hmm. CBS 13's Anna Giles tracked him down and another local World Trade Center survivor. She shares their tales from the South Tower and what they hope for the future. 
On September 11th, survivors ran. They tried to call their families and they tried to get home. Among them, Richard Hannaford from Natomas and Corey Daniel from Lodi. By the grace of God and my guardian angels, we're really busy that day. I ran all day because <laughs> I went on foot back to my hotel. They were in Tower 2, 20 floors apart. Richard had worked in New York City for decades, a corporate bond broker. Corey had just arrived for a two-week training, and the attack happened two days into that. They both remember the shaking as they ran downstairs. It took the impact of that plane, bowed, and then righted back up. I didn't know what to do, except I knew that if we got down, that we'll be okay. Corey ran through a stairwell full of panicked people. Richard says the one he found was empty. The biggest horror happened when they were finally out. People falling from the sky. A couple holding hands. And these sounds that I was hearing were people's bodies hitting the ground. Corey remembers the streets at a standstill. He thought of his wife worried at home. The pay phones weren't working, so he stopped a woman with a Blackberry and asked to send this message. I said, you know, hey, it's me. It's, you know, it's Corey. I'm okay. I'm out. Uh, I'll talk to you from the hotel tonight. As Richard waited for his phone call, Tower One collapsed. I thought to myself, oh my God, it's gonna, it's gonna fall. I did. And so did I. I ended up in some woman's lap. Richard doesn't remember how he got to his home near the city. Corey says it took him more than four days by bus and by plane to get home to Lodi. He had these two photos with him, bought two days after the attack. And there's even some scratches on the original piece because they were shuffled around when I had them on the bus going back to, from New York. He carried something to remember. On the 11th, survivors carried nothing but themselves. And 20 years later, they carry grief, innocent lives lost, and broken hearts. I can still see those faces today. We've all seen things in life we wish we hadn't seen, but those images just are seared into their memories. You can hear it. No escaping. Well, both survivors say that they hope that younger generations continue to learn about 9-11 and understand how it changed so many lives. Yeah, both say it left them really with a heightened sense of awareness when it comes to vigilance and security and safety. Curtis. Well, when planes hit the World Trade Center, thousands ran from those twin towers. But first responders ran toward the danger, including urban search and rescue teams from Sacramento. We covered them when they left and when they returned. The team's got a police escort to Travis Air Force Base where the only planes allowed to fly took off. The team took along specialized gear, including high tech cameras and several search dogs. And after two long weeks, they returned forever changed. We saw a lot of things when we were in uh, the Mira building in Oklahoma. We thought we'd seen pretty much everything there, but uh, there's no comparison to what we saw in New York. Uh, two decades later, some of those team members are still working. And CBS 13's Laura Hayfleet spoke with one of the Sacramento firefighters who searched ground zero. Uh, <laughs> I lost a really good friend. He was a New York City fireman. His name is Dana Hannon. Dana is etched in the memory of Sacramento City firefighter Chris Castamagna and on an engraved metal bracelet around his wrist. You don't forget about him, you never forget about him. But he has memories from September 11, 2001 that he wishes he could forget. Were you finding people both dead and alive? We, we didn't find anybody alive. Just hours after the towers fell, Chris Castamagna loaded onto a C-17 at Fairfield, California's Travis Air Force Base, deploying with Sacramento's urban search and rescue team to ground zero, one of the only planes allowed to fly. The fastest cross-country flight I've ever had. Fighter jets escorted the military aircraft into New Jersey and the team got to work. As we were going into Manhattan, we had to move police cars out of the street. Nothing could have prepared him for what he saw next. The punch in the face was seeing a 110 story building reduced to about five stories. The group did what they could to pull bodies from the piles. What we were finding was um, part of a person. That's a lot of, um, those are tough memories yeah. to have. 
memory does stick with you. 20 years later, I'm stronger. There was a time I needed help and I didn't realize how much stronger I could be and healthy I could be until I sought it out. Chris says he still thinks of that day. New Yorkers are tough. But what stays with him the most? The memory of his friend Dana Hannon, FDNY firefighter, Engine 26, Midtown Manhattan. What would you say today to your friend who you lost? That's a great question. Uh, I tell him I love him. He's everybody's hero. Just such incredible bravery that day. And in all, 343 New York City firefighters had died in the attacks on 9-11. In the 20 years since, a reported 250 firefighters have died from conditions and cancers linked to the attacks. According to a report from the New York City Fire Department, more than 11,000 firefighters, paramedics, and other workers have health problems linking back to the 9-11 attacks. 20 years later, 9-11 first responders are suffering from chronic acid reflux disease and breathing problems to fatal lung conditions and terminal cancers. According to the report, nearly 3,100 members of the fire department's health program had a cancer that could be linked to the attacks. Several had multiple types of cancer. Firefighters working at Ground Zero, they were not alone. Just hours after the attacks, a local chaplain boarded a military cargo plane bound for New York to help comfort first responders at Ground Zero. As CBS 13, Steve Large shows us Sacramento law enforcement chaplain Mindy Russell now believes it was the day she was born for. This was my hard hat. And when I was at Ground Zero, I had to wear my hard hat. Chaplain Mindy Russell's World Trade Center collection. Um, Bush came to Ground Zero. From her and 16 so days really at Ground Zero. To be given these by an officer or a firefighter is treasures. It doesn't seem that long ago. Russell just happened to be on the National Transportation Safety Board Red Cross volunteer list that September of 2001 and got the call to serve first responders in the first hours after the September 11th attack. Things were unimaginable. People saw things that were unimaginable. And you saw those things. Mm -hmm. Russell recalls the dignity of the search and rescue efforts in the dust and debris, carrying away each body found in the rubble in a flag draped casket. So one time I was asked, just stand here when they bring out another body and pray. Okay. So they would go right to the morgue, but I was standing right there to pray as they took the bodies away. The sight of the crumbled towers is seared into her memory. Those towers, when you walked around Ground Zero, there was not a trace of a office, desk, phone, file cabinet. There was nothing. In the 20 years yeah, since so the we attacks, were, Russell we has also seen more loss from her time at Ground Zero, the deaths of many who breathed in the toxic particles. You know, uh, several of my partners have died because of some of the illnesses and cancers they got. Russell has also been diagnosed with COPD and can no longer provide chaplaincy services at wildfires. She is now certified by the World Trade Center Health Program to receive medical help as a responder. When were you certified? Last week. So yeah. just a week ago, they but certified they you as having been there? Yes. Russell has no regrets. She believes responding to 9-11 was her life's calling. I know why I was born. A lot of hugs, a lot of talking. A life that led her to ground zero. In those worst days, Chaplain Mindy Russell provided comfort in the chaos. But somebody asked me, you know, was it worth it? And, and every one of us would say the same thing, absolutely. And I'd do it again, knowing exactly what I'd suffer from. Powerful words, she'd do it again. Yeah. Well, Russell has also responded to the aftermath of the massacre at the Munich Olympics and Hurricane Katrina. And she's been such a huge figure in local tragedies when law enforcement loses their life and she's there to help comfort those. She says because of her medical conditions, her work as a chaplain will now center on those in need in the Sacramento region only from now on. In the days following 9-11, candlelight memorials and tears were a common sight people tried to deal with emotional trauma of the attacks, the feelings of fear, despair, and anger. The tragedy also spurred many into action, searching for some way to help ease the pain of the nation. Some gave blood, others money, and patriotism surged across the nation. Hundreds of people in the Sacramento region gave blood to help victims of the attacks, many of them first-time donors. 
The Red Cross says 1.5 million units of blood were donated nationwide during the first two days after the attacks. Thank you very much. We're going to take a check back to New York and take all this money and deliver it ourselves. Well, from El Dorado County to Sacramento, firefighters and police took to the streets filling hats full of cash. At one event, firefighters raised a staggering $60,000 in cash in just a few hours. It all went to the families of the firefighters and police officers who died at the Twin Towers. And bonded by the attacks, the nation came together, showing their patriotism. American flags were on display everywhere, from homes to cars and large buildings. That little guy's got one. The Sacramento Flag Store struggled to keep up with the demand. Get this, people waited in line two blocks long to buy flags large and small. And I think so much of it is because they wanted just a symbol of what America meant as we saw the symbols of the Twin Tower fall. I think they wanted to hold on to that and keep that dear to show their patriotism. Yeah, it also prompted a lot of people to join the military to defend the nation. Marley? That's right, Elizabeth and Tony. So many people just wanted to do whatever they could to be a part of this and to help after the attacks. Thousands of Americans dropped everything to serve their country. In fact, more than 181,000 Americans enlisted in active duty service. Another nearly 73,000 joined the enlisted reserves. According to the USO, many of those service members said the 9-11 attacks inspired their choice to serve. Just incredible. Well, immediately after 9-11, California's National Guard was put on alert to be ready to be called into action in Sacramento as Guard members prepped for possible war, both physically and emotionally. Their families also worried about what was to come. I really uh, don't know exactly how I prepare for it mentally and on an individual basis. I don't really think about it that much. I just say to myself, when they call, I'm ready to go. It hurts sometimes knowing that he could go over there and get killed, not come home. And yeah, so much anxiety with that. The war on terror launched within hours of 9-11 with the first strike less than a month to follow in Afghanistan. The U.S. invasion of Afghanistan aimed to dismantle Al-Qaeda, the terrorist group that had executed the September 11th attacks. Several years later, a set of brothers would sign up to fight for their country but only one would make it back alive. Their mother now bound to suffer the impact of 9-11 for the rest of her life. It's impacted the rest of my life until I take my last breath. My heart is forever broken. Deborah Getz remembers being glued to the news, gripped by every detail as 9-11 changed her life. And I remember I was watching Good Day Sacramento and I seen the live the second plane hit and I thought, What's happening? Watching alongside her, her two young boys, Christopher and Nick, both determined to join the military and support their country. Both of my boys wanted to do something. They just weren't old enough yet. Um, so at 12 years old, you're just thinking, oh yeah, it's just a kid talking. He's in eighth grade. 9-11 didn't scare him from those ideas? No. No, he wanted to do something to help his country. And that's exactly what both boys did. Christopher became the youngest Army Ranger and was deployed to Afghanistan. Nick was deployed to Iraq. Both fighting the war on terrorism, Christopher never made it home. It breaks my heart because as a mom, I was supposed to be there to pick him up, and I wasn't in Afghanistan to get him. It's, it's hard. It's very hard for me. I just want him back, and I can't. Every year since, Deborah has set up a Christmas toy drive to help military families, knowing what they've lost to give to their country. There's a hole in all of the Gold Star families' hearts, and it, you can never fail it. There are, there's no words to say to us, but we know what our child was doing, um, whether it was our son or our daughters, um, they were doing it for, for our freedoms. The sacrifices that so many families made. Christopher was one of eight soldiers who died in Afghanistan when a military helicopter crashed in 2007. His brother Nick fought active duty in Iraq and was honorably discharged in 2008. Oh, Gold Star family is such a special group. Marley, thank you. The war on terror began in Afghanistan, of course, but it did not end there. In 2003, the U.S. invaded Iraq for its ties to Al Qaeda and reported weapons of mass destruction. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. 
The Iraqi invasion began in March. U.S. troops captured the country's president, Saddam Hussein, in December. He was later tried by the interim Iraqi government for crimes against humanity and executed in 2006. And nearly 10 years after 9-11, U.S. forces finally found and killed the mastermind behind the attacks on the U.S. In May of 2011, President Obama announced the death of Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda, and America celebrated. As part of how it looked and sounded as hundreds cheered outside the White House, President Obama thanked the intelligence community for their dogged pursuit of bin Laden and the men who carried out the mission. The war on terrorism has been costly, of course, in terms of American lives. And so far, more than 7,000 U.S. service members have died in post-9-11 wars. Curtis? From our area alone, we lost close to 100 lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some just teenagers choosing to leave high school early after seeing the Twin Towers fall. Each of them writing blank checks for their lives to this country. Checks our nation cashed. And we wanted to pause to tell you about a few of our local heroes. Robert T. Rapp left Sonora High School six months early to join the Army. His family says he had a duty burning in him after September 11th. He served in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and on a piece of binder paper he wrote, if he didn't make it, let the world know I died doing what I love. Dying for my country is the greatest honor I could ever receive. The tombstone of Stockton's Victor Cervantes reads, Freedom is not free, words the Army Sergeant requested if he did not survive. He was 27 when he was shot dead while on patrol. Army Specialist Adam Kinzer was just one week from returning home in 2004 for the birth of his first child. The star athlete from Rio Vista High died in an explosion. His son, who he never met, is now 17 years old. Marine Sergeant Nicole G. from Roseville, among the last Americans killed in Afghanistan, pictured here holding that baby. She posted it to social media saying, I love my job. The 23-year-old was one of 13 service members killed in last month's suicide blast at the Kabul airport. The war in Afghanistan officially ended August 30th with chaos getting American forces and citizens out. Some Americans have yet to get out. The conflict ended just shy of 20 years, making it the longest war in U.S. history. It was almost twice as long as America's involvement in the Vietnam War and five times longer than World War II. Just ahead, so many refugees who helped with America in its mission in those countries now live here in Sacramento, and more are headed our way. The challenges they face as they make our city home. Millions of students were in classrooms when the attacks happened, and explaining that America was under attack, well, that fell to teachers. We look back at how teachers explained what was happening and hear from young students trying to grapple with their emotions. And he was steadfast and a steadfast sight in America in Sacramento after 9-11, the special way he paid tribute to the lives lost in the attacks, calling for unity in the United States. Welcome back to our CBS and Sacramento special remembering 9-11. Thanks for joining us. Most of us can remember where we were and what we were doing on 9-11 when the attacks happened. And then President George W. Bush was sitting in an elementary school classroom in Sarasota, Florida at 8.50 that morning. Video shows White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card walk up to the president and whisper in his ear, America is under attack. You can see President Bush silently grapple with the information while he sits in front of a group of young students as one of the darkest days in recent U.S. history started to unfold. And just like the president, millions of American children were in classrooms when the attacks unfolded. And explaining what was happening 
while trying to shield and comfort them, fell largely on the teachers. On the day after September 12, 2001, we went to two Sacramento classrooms to see how teachers and students were coping. Here's reporter Marcy Valenzuela's report. Pearl Harbor, the Kennedy assassination, the Challenger explosion, they are events so monumental we remember exactly where we were when they happened. And for today's generation of children, yesterday's terrorist attack is their first introduction to a major tragedy. They will remember that they were in Mrs. Bradford's class in, in 19, or excuse me, in 2001 when this happened. So it is one of those bookmark events, unfortunately. And so today, sixth grade students in Mrs. Bradford's class spent the day talking and writing about what they saw and how they feel. I feel hopeless. I feel sorry for all those families. I was actually really mad to see that how would so why would somebody want to crash a plane into the Twin Towers. Their emotions range from nervous and scared to confused and hurt. Obviously, Congress must know that the American people are for finding out who did this. At the high school level, it was much the same. Senior students talked about their own feelings in government class. My fear is that this will result in discrimination against anyone whose family is descended from the Middle East. Students at McClatchy High School shared concerns of retaliation, acting too quickly, and political fallout. National security. Teachers admittedly didn't have all the answers, but they know just getting children to talk will be important in the coming days, as we all struggle to cope with one of the worst days in American history. Marcy's report from the day after the attacks. It was so crucial and important for the kids and the students to start talking right away about this and not have feelings bottled up. For everyone to try to start processing. Yeah, it didn't even seem real. Imagine being a teacher walking in and just having to talk about this. In New York, by the way, many teachers had to lower the shades in their classrooms because they had a direct view of the burning towers. Marley. Well, America vowed to never forget the attacks, creating memorials across the country to remember the lives lost. This is September 11 Memorial Plaza at Cal Expo. It features an I-beam pulled from the wreckage from the World Trade Center. It was a support beam from the North Tower. There's also a fountain with granite sphere with the names of all the victims etched on its surface. Also a bell tower, reflections of the World Trade Center and other memorials to American Airlines Flight 77 and United Airlines Flight 93. T.J. Hargrave. Then every year at Ground Zero in New York, the names of all the people lost in the attacks are read aloud at the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York, where the towers once stood. The museum is underground and aims to connect visitors to the past, recognizing the victims, the survivors, and how America was forever changed. Marty, you mentioned Flight 93. While well, the attacks in New York and at the Pentagon get most of the attention, one group is trying to make sure what happened in Pennsylvania is also remembered. And the Friends of Flight 93 want to make sure students who weren't alive in 2001 know what happened that day and about the 40 heroes on that plane and the countless lives they saved. In this spot in rural Pennsylvania, history is alive for teachers Tina Johnston and Katie Speary. The Flight 93 National Memorial helps Speary tell the 9-11 story to students who weren't alive to remember that day. Johnston, now retired, volunteers to teach this difficult subject. She brought her classes to this site where Flight 93 crashed after the passengers and crew attempted to regain control from the hijackers weaving Shakespeare into the lesson. The nonprofit Friends of Flight 93 helps educators tell the 9-11 story. Danielle Miller coordinates with teachers across the country, both in person and virtually, offering students workshops and tours.
Ohio middle school teacher Scott Marsh is using these tools in his classroom. Now they participate in a University of Pittsburgh study exploring how the Flight 93 Memorial and other sites resonate with children. A new generation making its own connection to a pivotal day in our nation's history. The Flight 93 Memorial is located in Stoystown, Pennsylvania. It's open every day except New Year's, Christmas and Thanksgiving. Some of the most iconic items tied to 9-11 and the hunt for Osama bin Laden are inside a museum most Americans will never see. That gym bag belongs to the youngest passenger on Flight 93. She was actually on her way back to college that day. This is the CIA Museum Deep Inside Agency Headquarters in Virginia. On display, a scale model used to brief Navy SEALs and President Obama on the raid that took down Osama bin Laden. Brick collected from the compound in northern Pakistan where he was found and the rifle found next to bin Laden when he was killed in 2011. The museum director says the collection on display is just as much about the past as it is the future. This isn't just history for history's sake. We want our officers to look at these artifacts and then maybe come up with a new idea for a mission that's happening today. Also there, the chopper that flew the first post 9-11 CIA team into Afghanistan. It's there for officers to see, remembering what's come before them and how they might impact what's next. How local Muslim and Sikh communities dealt with the hate and racist attacks against them after 9-11, bridging the gap between the unknown and understanding. And so much has changed since the attacks. A closer look at the immediate and the lasting impacts. As we head to break, a viewer shares their story reflecting on the attacks. I remember thinking about the people jumping out of windows and my heart was so heavy watching how the people were falling, people were locked in the building. One lady particularly was the woman that was pregnant and she wanted to go out and uh, get coffee and she was one of the ones that was killed. It was just, it's hard to remember. Two decades after 9-11, the criminal trial against the man who organized the attack is still going on. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four co-defendants accused of helping the hijackers attended a military court hearing in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba this week. The defense team argues interrogations were tainted by torture done at so-called black sites and should not be allowed as evidence. After the attacks, there was backlash against Muslim and Sikh communities, including right here in Sacramento. CBS 13's Valina Jones revisited a temple that was vandalized with a message from leadership 20 years later. Police came here to inform us that be careful, something might happen. That warning back in 2001 from West Sacramento police to the Sikh temple of Sacramento. After 9-11, days later, their fears came true. A man who had visited the temple before came back to vandalize it. And he says, I'm going to bulldoze uh, uh, this flag and the building. The man instead jumped the fence and defiled their pool. Jumped in the pool. That's the holy water. Our temple. Balbir Singh Don't Dillon, it. now the temple president, remembers oh. sitting next to the man responsible facing hate crime charges. The temple instead spoke on his behalf. Uh, we shouldn't hate each other. The way he was apologizing, I could tell that he was apologizing from the bottom of his heart. Two decades later, Darshan Singh Mundi believes their work with the Interfaith Council in Sacramento and community has helped bridge the gap from unknown to understanding. And that time, 
people didn't like us. We were the turban. We were looking like uh, the other people. And, uh, but now the people know who we are. The temple was not the only target in the days and years after the terrorist attacks. Hate crimes and vandalism against Muslim and Sikh communities skyrocketed. It was almost like it was okay to be, to be a racist. To be a Care California, a civil rights organization, has witnessed the impacts of crime on the community, even impacting the younger generation. Some folks trying to hide their identity, um, some of them changing their names, um, some of them trying to speak a little different. Um, just so they can try to fit in and so they, they, won't, they won't get bullied. For Dylan, while some painful memories have faded, he hopes their mission is fresh in people's mind. Love all. All human race is one. That's what our holy book says. The charges against that suspect were eventually dropped after a leadership at the temple worked with his attorney and the DA. Now, the temple says they didn't want the man to face charges, but instead wanted to see him educated about their culture and their faith. Now take a look at this, at volunteers placing 7,000 American flags in the St. Louis Park honoring the victims of 9-11. That's one flag for each American service member and first responder who has died since 9-11 looks incredible. The 13 service members killed in the terrorist attack in Kabul last week, including Roseville's Nicole G, are now among those being remembered. Each flag includes dog tags and the picture of a service member killed in wartime. The display is nearly 11 miles of flag rows across 10 acres. It just gives you chills. From thousands of flags to just one and one man. If you drove in the Sacramento area in the days after 9-11, you most likely saw him, a man on an overpass wearing a tri-corner hat holding a large American flag and saluting motorists. Tony Tosta, one of our photographers back in 2001, caught up with him on a late September evening. It's a matter of either staying at home and crying or getting mad or coming out here and being free to see how people are reacting to this. If a flag were hanging here, they wouldn't be responding to it. Put a person behind a flag and they'll respond to it every time. That's because they see somewhat part of themselves in the other person waving the flag at them. And so together you're holding the flag. And I think that's what this means. And I think it shows a unity, which is what we are. We're a United States. We're a United States of Americans. If you look at their faces like I see, they, it's an acknowledgement. They're acknowledging not just me, they're acknowledging the flag. They're acknowledging the country and what they've got ahead of them. We're fighting a different kind of animal. It's evil. It makes me feel good to know that, like, fellow citizens are into this. I mean, if they weren't into it, I'd feel really depressed right now, and I don't. I've been out here since 3. Other nights, I might stay till 7 o'clock, till the sun goes down in the west. Just make you feel at the end of the day. Tired. <laughs> My thumb gets pretty tired, but I go home and take a hot shower and everything's okay, ready for the next day. Wow, isn't that an incredible shot of him? It's amazing how just one man can spread that much love and patriotism throughout an area. Indeed. The attacks immediately changed our way of life in the U.S., like seeing military personnel armed with rifles at our airports, helping with security checkpoints. Gone were the days of greeting family and friends at the gates. For so many of us, the fear of the unknown grew after the attacks. Yeah, we didn't know what our new world was going to look like. So much has changed since then. And here's a look at the immediate impact and the lasting changes. Air travel as we knew it changed forever after 9-11. At Sacramento International Airport, the impact was felt in the immediate hours after the attack. One plane on its way to Denver from San Francisco was diverted here after the FAA ordered all planes to land at the nearest airport. In the days that followed, National Guard troops and local law enforcement armed and ready made their presence felt. And then there are the lasting changes to security at Sac International, too many to mention. 
But remember when we didn't have to take off our shoes or worry about the size of our shampoo bottle? On the ground here in our region, some less publicized changes still linger. Tours of the Folsom Dam stopped, deemed a security risk. In fact, in the days right after 9-11, all access points to the dam were closed off. While there were no credible threats to specific targets in Sacramento, National Guard members were on alert. But, you know, the general thought is, is that it can happen, and that's why we're, we're preparing for that type of event. One area of concern, the California Aqueduct, which transports water from northern to southern California, which is open in some places, opening up the fear that someone would sabotage the system, cutting off the water supply. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, San Francisco city officials were concerned about visible landmarks. Police patrols were stepped up at the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge symbolizes an engineering feat, symbolizes what Americans can accomplish. They'll do anything to achieve their ends, which is to destroy this country. Another immediate impact right after the attacks, planes and helicopters fighting California wildfires were grounded until state officials got an exemption from the FAA. Caltrans changed its focus in the days after 9-11 as well, stopping scheduled road work to focus on inspecting bridges and tunnels. At the state capitol, it was the first time a terrorist attack had sent lawmakers and staff home. Yes, 9-11 shifted our landscape, but perhaps more importantly, it shook up our psyche. Two decades later, the aftershock still lingers. I was just struck listening to a lot of people talk about what they were doing, where they were. The passengers on planes, it had to be rerouted and land right away. I mean, mm -hmm. just to hear the voice of the pilot say, America is under attack, we need to land. Yeah, and yeah, the, to have that sink in now, it's taken time to yeah. process just what that all meant, yeah. Curtis? Well, since 9-11, a community of Afghans has blossomed here in Sacramento. In fact, one in nine Afghans in the U.S. now lives here, hundreds arriving in just the past month. Desperate to leave their homeland, perhaps never to see it again. They're gonna kill me right away. Ramat Safari risked his own life, serving as an interpreter for the special forces. With his daughters by his side in Germany last month, he told CBS News he hoped to make it to Sacramento, where so many Afghans have settled. Making it to U.S. soil means freedom. But what do you do when your life now consists of what's in your pockets? and what you could throw in a shopping bag. And the biggest concern right now for me is my family. This man, his wife, and their two young children just arrived in Sacramento, finding the transition tough, especially with his parents still back home. Sometimes I say, I wish I could not make this trip. Whatever happened, I should be at their side. They need to rebuild their life, and you don't just do that overnight. World Relief Sacramento is working to give refugees a sense they belong here. Providing housing, basic furniture, and groceries. Distributing what so many have donated, now sitting in this warehouse. We'll set some goals uh, for her over the next couple of months. Helping them learn English and find work. And if you look around, there are signs of success. Small businesses like Shams, an Afghan grocery store and bakery on Auburn Boulevard. And as more come to Sacramento, it builds a community. Once a community is here, others want to come. <laughs> Tough at first. Some refugees say it's eventually rewarding. After a year, you're a part of this community. You have to contribute to this community. Work with the community member, find some connection. Ahmad Samir, who arrived in 2008, agrees. Now part of Sacramento's little Kabul community. You can feel like a home in here. It's the dream for those just arriving. I'm hopeful for a future. I'm not thinking about myself much. I think about my kids' futures. There are many and many opportunities for them. And also for me to work for them, to feed them, to support them, to guide him. Well, I spent the past couple of days tracking down Ramat, who you saw in Germany with his two daughters, and I found them in New Jersey. He just sent me this picture. His wife, his daughters, his parents and siblings are all at Fort Dix, New Jersey together. He says he appreciates the U.S. getting them to safety, but a change of plans instead of coming here to Sacramento, he now plans to move to Virginia, where he learned it's much more affordable. But I'll tell you the reason that uh, I am doing a show and the reason I am back to work. Television was different after the attacks. Programming like The Late Show with David Letterman was pulled off the air in order to focus on news. 
Coming up, we'll take a closer look at how TV changed and who Letterman said inspired him to get back on the air six days later. As a nation, the attacks glued our world together, but has that feeling of community tapered off? A look at lessons learned from 9-11. The shock waves from the attack on America being felt far beyond the immediate targets in New York and in our nation's capital, Washington. The attacks had a huge impact on American television. CBS dropped its comedy lineup. Episodes of Everybody Loves Raymond and King of Queens didn't air that night. Some networks just went dark, like HGTV and HSN, simply putting up a slate saying they're pausing all programming due to the events. The Late Show with David Letterman went off the air for six days after the attacks. Letterman returned to late night, though, on September 17th. As this story we aired back then shows, that night was an emotional show as he and the rest of America worked to move forward together. David Letterman's Late Show was back on the air Monday night. But I'll tell you the reason that uh, I am doing a show and the reason I am back to work is because of uh, Mayor Giuliani. Uh, very early on, uh, after the attack, and, and how strange does it uh, sound to invoke that phrase, after the attack, um, Mayor Giuliani encouraged us and here lately implored us to, to go back to our lives, go on living, uh, continue trying to make uh, New York City uh, the place that it should be. And because of him, I'm, I'm here tonight. And I just want to say one other thing about Mayor Giuliani. As this began, uh, and if you were like me, and in many respects, uh, God, I hope you're not. <laughs> but in this one small measure, if you're like me, and, and you're watching and you're confused and, and, and depressed and, and irritated and, and angry and full of grief, and you don't know how to behave, and you're not sure what to do, and you don't really, because we've never been through this before, all you had to do at any moment was watch the mayor. Watch how this guy behaved. Watch how this guy conducted himself. Watch what this guy did. Listen to what this guy said. Rudolph Giuliani is the personification of courage. And, and there was even more emotion as CBS Evening News anchor Dan Rather appeared on the show talking about what we might expect to happen. We send our sons and daughters into this kind of war, into this twilight zone that they're going. There'll be great casualties. now. It remains to be seen whether we have the staying power. That's basically up to you and me and everybody in the audience and every American, whether we have the staying power, whether we have the will uh, to stay with it is the big question. But you say, well, you know, will it do anything? I certainly think it can. But what would we think of ourselves if we didn't try? Rather broke down again, talking about how America is viewed and the firefighters handling the rescue efforts. Americans are noted the world around, you know, for having great courage, having a great military, but the world's view of us in, in many places with many people is we just don't have the stomach to stick anything out. And it was said, well, we were great during World War II, yeah, but this is a new generation, or they're all right, spoiled. It better change. It better so we're now, going to, we're now being put to the test. But I'll tell you this, if they could go down to ground zero here in Lower Manhattan, and you referred to it earlier, and see the following. See those firemen? <laughs> Take his breath, will you? Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, well, uh, I can finish No, it. no, no, Dan, take care of yourself. We'll, we'll be right back here with Dan Rather. And that's from the great Dan Rather, who reported from some of the worst war zones you could imagine. A lot of men, by the way, was the first to go back on the airwaves late night. And Guys, it truly was a necessary move, I think. Yeah, it really was. I mean, everyone wanted to sort of see something come back to normal somewhat. That Late Show episode really set the tone for America to start to heal. Yeah, that night, it, it, start, it started bringing the country together that night. But uh, 20 years later, mm -hmm. boy, don't we seem divided. I mean, just look at Rudy Giuliani. Uh, described there once described as America's mayor. Some saying he really went off the rails during the Trump administration. He's now under federal investigation, uh, disbarred for his claims. The election was rigged. 
Uh, he says he's the same guy, though. He says it's really America that went off the rails. Yeah, and, and look at what happened just a matter of months ago with the insurrection at the Capitol. The issue, it now seems like, is more homegrown Americans versus Americans, whether it's polarized politics or issues with police brutality we've seen in the last year, the random mass shootings as well that we've unfortunately seen so many of. Yeah, we'll touch on that in a little bit. But uh, as we said earlier, we all remember where we were and what we were doing when that horrific day happened. And I was in San Antonio. We're going to share with you what we were doing 20 years ago. I was anchoring the news in San Antonio, and I think a lot of people thought of their families, right, their immediate families, and my thought just went to my then two-year-old son, Zach. It was all about Elmo back then, Elmo's world, watching it every day. Back then, the old VHS tape was working, and that's what we were all about, and I just kept thinking how Zach's world was about to change, and I came home and I said, we were living in San Antonio, all our families in California, L.A. and Sacramento, and I said, we, we got to move. We got to move closer to family. Because bottom line is you never know when your time is up. You never know when you are going to be done in this world. And those attacks taught us as a family that you need to cherish those around you and really shower the people that you love with love and be close to them. Yeah, that, absolutely. Well, I had just started college and classes were, of course, canceled that day and everyone who went home did, including me. My family and I had actually just visited New York City for the first time for spring break earlier that year. We saw, you know, all the iconic spots, Times Square, Statue of Liberty and the towers, never knowing a few months later they'd be gone. And two years later, I worked as an intern in Washington, D.C., and they actually required all of us to always have tennis shoes with us at all times in case we had to walk or run out of the city, as so many did that day uh, with mass transit shut down. Mm, that's crazy to yeah. think about. Uh, I was a reporter in Redding, uh, California, uh, my first job, and I took a few days off because uh, my nephew was just born. He was born on September 9th, born in San Francisco. Uh, it was an exciting time for the family, only to wake up two days later to this. And I remember thinking this world this is what he entered. Uh, here he is now, he just turned 20. Oh. He's a, a good kid, he's a junior at Chapman University. Wow, and I, and I was actually working uh, my first job as well, on my way into work in Savannah, Georgia. And I remember I heard it on the radio. I walked into the newsroom because I still couldn't believe what I had just heard. And everyone in the newsroom was crowded around the TVs watching. And when I looked up, they were just replaying those images again and again. And I have to tell you, you know, we cover so many diff difficult stories. That story left me with nightmares. I can remember waking up in the middle of the night because we were for days, weeks afterwards doing nothing but reading and listening and hearing all of those stories. And, and you, you relive them with people, jumping out of the buildings and all of the, the me voicemail messages to family members. And I remember our news director actually coming out at one point days later saying, if any of you need to just go home mm -hmm. yeah. and just reset, please do that. It shook so many to their core. I well, mean. And I, I just remember growing up in a, in a country where you say war doesn't come here mm -hmm. to the United States. Right. That's mm -hmm. something that happens overseas. And to, to just see that yeah. rock your world mm -hmm. to know that we could have a war right on U.S. soil is really hard to yeah I remember going back and saying honey let's put back the elmo tapes because we need to escape we need to get into right. it yeah just, enough is enough seeing it but uh you just cannot get those images out of your mind no. you know the shock of that day was really sewn in the fabric of sadness and newfound patriotism and pride emerged but we asked this before have the impressive images of togetherness faded something to think about as we take a closer look at how our nation and our region came together Three, yeah, four, five, six, Panic turned to patriotism after America was attacked on its own soil. The day after the towers fell, there was a two-hour-long wait at the Sacramento flag store, which sold 10,000 American flags in one day. We didn't expect this long line, but it's yeah. worth it. Um, I'm buying them for all our employees to, and for our vehicles um, to, to, to show our support. Support swelled in other ways. A patriotic wave swept over local blood banks. The silver lining of all of this bad stuff is the fact that we've seen literally hundreds of first-time donors. Fear fueled faith as well. At Sacramento's Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament, deep prayers followed the deep sorrow. 
and comforting words brought a temporary calm. This does not uh, in any way define uh, humankind. Uh, we're much better <laughs> as a people than, than the tragedy today. It was a tragedy that glued our world together. Many would argue it wouldn't stick. Some might even say the messy exit from Afghanistan, a war zone launched because of 9-11, exemplifies how complicated our lives became after the tragedy 20 years ago. And the divisive events, and in some circles, waning patriotism, can't help but make you wonder if we've taken a step back after coming together after the chaos. Perhaps this 20-year commemoration will remind us of our one nation and how better we are when we truly are united. One other thing to think about, our society and our, and our world was so different back then. There was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no disconnect where you could bully behind a, a phone and the keyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people were closer back then because they communicated more. They, yeah, they, right. they saw more of the human connection and kindness and I just kind of wish that we can get that back. But now as we are coming out of this worldwide pandemic, I think there has been sort of a coming together in a different way to some degree yeah. uh, as people use those tools to, to, to find a way to connect again. Yeah. yeah, we always said, as Curtis mentioned, we didn't think war would come to us. We never thought we'd live through a pandemic. So you're right, those two things are kind of married and perhaps it could cause uh, and spark some unity. You just hope that it doesn't take a tragedy to bring us all together. Yeah. We can just right. do it on and our own. We could own. continue this. Right. Moving forward, yeah. Well, we were honored to be together with you in this special. We leave you with a look at the New York skyline, which much like all of us as a nation and as a people, was forever changed by what happened 20 years ago.